Today on Modern Mondays, I'm driving an F11 BMW 520D Touring, the fifth generation of the 5 Series, and a really good second-hand buy now, I think. And potentially an excellent second-hand buy. If you're in the market for a large premium and state car, there aren't that many choices anymore. Audi, Mercedes, Volvo, and BMW. This is the F11 520D M Sport Touring. Let's take a look around. The F10 Saloon and F11 Estate ran from 2010 to 2017. This is the fifth generation of the 5 Series, and the first three had been the epitome of style, design, quality. Generation 4, the E60 and E61, let the side down a little bit in a number of areas. Chris Bangle's flame mesh design was really love it or loathe it. I actually quite liked it and thought it gave it a bit of a distinctive personality, but I was less keen on the reliability and it was a real low point and regarded by many as the least reliable BMW that's ever been made. However, with the F10 series, they've kind of gone back to basic. It's almost as though they skipped the E60 generation entirely. The external and internal styling looks more like it's developed from the E39, the generation three car, rather than the E60. It's much less in your face and a bit more refined than the E60 was. And reliability-wise, things have got better again. Under Adrian von Hoydonk's design studio direction, the saloon was designed by Jacek Froelich, but the touring was designed by Jean-Francois Alexandre Huet. There's not a lot to see under the bonnet because most of it is covered by a big piece of plastic, but beneath that big piece of plastic is the N47 four-cylinder turbo diesel engine. It's a long-running two-litre series from BMW, but it's worth checking that you've got the N47T, which is the update which has far fewer problems with the timing chain and timing chain guides which were initially a slight issue and on previous generations of the engine a huge issue as were turbo failures and an awful lot of these cars will have been company cars so will have been serviced on schedule so double check that and when you take it for a test drive just listen for any rattles from the front now there are two reasons you buy the estate version rather than the saloon first wagons are cool obviously secondly you need to put a lot of stuff in the car and take it places and you cannot go better than this with the seats up, 560 litres of space. With the seats down, 1,670. Either way, that's 60 litres more than the old E61 version. It's not just the space that's handy. This load space cover automatically rises up with the boot so you give easy access to your stuff. You can, of course, pull it down and detach it if you want to. You have a built-in dog guard which hooks up into the ceiling and there are also hooks behind the drivers and passenger seats. So if you need to put things further forward and protect the front passengers, you can. You have a power socket for charging things like a mini fridge or chargers or inverters. You can flip the rear seats forward with a little lever here and here. 60-40 split. You have a large underfloor storage area which is divided into two areas and held up on a hydraulic ram that doesn't keep falling and trapping your hands. This is a really useful space for all kinds of things. And hidden beneath that, in what might have been a spare wheel well once upon a time, is the battery and the ECU, so I don't get water in there. You also have storage bins here on the left and the right, which although you have exposed wires and things, are handy for stuff like the first aid kit, which you aren't gonna need every day. And of course this load space covered bar does lift out as well, meaning the whole thing is basically a big comfy transit van. You could live in here if you wanted to. And before I walk away, and get in the front of the car. Let's not forget this really, really nice feature of all BMW estates or tourings, lift up tailgate glass. So useful. You might think this is a gimmick, but you'll be amazed how often you actually use this in the real world. I think I used it as much on my five series estate as I did the entire tailgate. These cars are designed for long distance drivers who are gonna spend most of their working day sitting in the front seat. And as such, it's a really nice place to be. It's really well laid out and all the controls feel just such good quality. Everything you touch just feels solid and premium. The materials feel much better in this generation than they did in the last generation. If you're coming up for an E60, you will really feel the difference in quality. As with many BMWs, the driver's seat is six way adjustable with electric recline and raising and lowering, but manual forward and backing. And of course, there's an adjustable headrest as well. So I guess that makes it eight-way adjustable really, doesn't it? But this is an M-Sport spec car from the factory. It may not look it because the M-Sport wheels are in the garage. Because it's winter time here in England, we've got winter tires and winter wheels on the car at the moment. But this is the M-Sport wheel, which is beautifully chunky and it's got lovely soft leather as well. And it's multifunction. You've got radio, cruise, and phone controls all fingertip away on the steering wheel. 
These are really well specced, even in standard form. All get Dakota leather, auto air conditioning, self-leveling rear air suspension, parking sensors front and rear, and Bluetooth. Moving up to M Sport, gets 18-inch double-spoke M wheels, dark chrome tailpipes, anthracite headlining, aluminium hex trim, or this car does have a dark wood finish instead, M Sport steering wheel, M Sport body kit, M Sport suspension, and electric sports seats. Other options you could go and spec individually include driving mode, regenerative braking, head-up display, radar cruise control, aka active cruise with stop and go, blind spot monitoring, lane departure warning, night vision, integral active steering or rear steer in real words, side view and top view cameras, and speed limit display. The instrumentation is beautiful and clear. It's something BMW do really well. This is virtually Honda Civic level of clarity. The speedo goes up to 160, which is probably not beyond the realms of probability with this engine. It uses real needles, so they're lovely and clear, even in low light conditions. Over to the left, you have your iDrive display, which in this car has the standard smaller screen, but a much wider screen filling this entire plastic area is available, which gives you much better sat nav and other options. In fact, BMW was one of the first manufacturers to include DAB as standard across its entire range. So depending on the model year you buy, you may well have DAB as standard. Moving down, you have the large air vents and the start-stop button. Now, I'm not a fan of start-stop, I've said it before, because what do you do with the keys when you start-stop the button? Do in your pocket so it hurts, in the door pocket so you walk away and forget about it? Leaving the house and just drive off without your keys? I don't know, not a fan, but hey, it's the thing when you live with it. And you have your auto start-stop off button as well, so you can cancel that in traffic if should you wish. Below that, you've got your FM, AM, possibly DAB, depending on the year, radio, and a CD player as well, which is obviously being deleted in many cars now, so it's nice to still have that option. And moving down the console, we have all our heating and comfort controls. Automatic air conditioning, dual zone left and right for both passengers, heated seats left and right, multi-stage power so you can have different levels. And this car doesn't have the smoker's pack, so you have a little cubby hole, ideal for things slightly smaller than an iPhone. And beneath that, a sweet wrapper hole and 12 volt socket to plug in your charger. Now this car, I'm particularly pleased to be driving today because it's a manual. It's got the nice six speed manual gearbox with a short stubby lever, nice perfect size leather gear knob and it feels great in your hand. And I'm really looking forward to taking this for a drive in a moment because this is a sweet thing to have and an absolute high point of any BMW is this manual gearbox. Talking about driving, you have multi modes as well. A rocker button next to the gear shift, comfort through to sport. Moving to comfort, the suspension becomes a little bit softer. The MPG maybe increases because you're not pushing the car so hard. Moving to sport, it tightens the suspension, it sharpens the steering response and it, and it shortens the actuation on the throttle pedal as well. So everything just picks up and becomes a bit more brisk and amazingly for a car of this size, does feel very sporting indeed. Behind that we have another thing I'm not a big fan of, but we will live with as well, is the parking brake, the electronic handbrake. It's a thing every car seems to have now. <sighs> what can I say? Every car has them now. And then we have the iDrive. It has come on massively in this generation. It's much more usable, much more interactive. And some versions of it even have a touch top so you can write the letters rather than trying to navigate through the, um, the turn wheel and push button, which makes life even easier. So look for higher spec iDrive if you're looking at 520. Now one bizarre choice about this car is that it's only got one cup holder. You'd think a car that's designed for motorway miles, it's seating for five, it would have cup holders and things everywhere, but no, it's only got the one cup holder here in the center, which does have a curious little ejector seat mechanism for James bonding your cup through the roof. I think maybe the idea is that it grips a smaller cup, but I'm not 100% sure because I can't get the cup into it when it's pushed down and the cup fits fine when it's not. It's not the best cup holder in the world and be honest, BMW have had a bad track record with cup holders because the E60 had cup holders which came out right in front of the air vents and blocked the air vent from you and then dripped onto the centre console. So nothing's really changed. And in terms of storage in the front of the car, you have a huge lockable centre bin. Push the button, opens double-sided. It's very wide, not that deep, but it's useful storage nonetheless. There is a phone cradle, so if you have the correct model of phone, you can have it connected up inside there. But to be honest, I'm not sure it's taken up very often because I'm just an iPhone or Android these days and just use it through Bluetooth. The door pockets are fairly large. They're felt lined, so you can put glasses in there without scratching them. It'll fit a wallet and a few other bits and bobs in there quite happily. And finally, the glove box, which is reasonably large. It's almost surprising you don't see more 5 Series Tourings doing taxi duty because the rear legroom in this car is phenomenal. I mean, you're virtually in a different time zone to the driver. The seat 
is very comfortable as well. Obviously nice and leather trim, same as the front. It would be, wouldn't it? Leather trim door card as well, and kind of rubberized back on that. So it makes it very easy to grip if you've got wet hands and that kind of thing. Big door pockets again, again felt lined. Electric windows, it's nice kind of sculpted metal door handles, which are very pretty. And the same kind of, I mean, this car, it's a dark wood, which looks almost black until the light catches it and you see the grain of the wood shining out. It's rather elegant. Both front seats have a big map pocket in the back, which is kind of a hard topped edge thing, which elastically comes out and you can fit quite a lot of stuff in there, should you wish. And curiously, something I've not really seen before, you've got a twin deck cubby hole here in the back of the center console. So you can put, I don't know, maybe two mobile phones, many suites, many small items for kids. And this is actually, if you've got two children in child seats, this is actually a really good sized car because there's loads of room for the child seats, their feet sticking forward. It's fantastic. Not just adults will appreciate the size you have here. Also, you have two individually turn off and onable air vents for the rear passengers blowing from the center. And here in the middle, you have a large armrest, which doubles up as a fairly good sized cubby hole and cup holders, which are actually better sized and positioned than the one in the front. Rear seat passengers are treated to their own courtesy light here in the back and individual reading lights and rear speakers over the ceiling in the boot. This is a very nice place to be. I think I might just stay here to be honest. The sound deadening on this is quite impressive. You hear a little bit of a rumble from the engine but very little in the way from wind noise and tyre noise which is surprising considering how large the tyres are. The ride today is a little bit softer than usual because it's on winter tyres, so it's a, a taller profile rubber tyre and softer compound than normally it would be a bit more crisp than we're feeling at the moment. But that said, it's still quite a nice ride and it isn't exactly soft either. It's just comfortable. And when we get to the back roads, I'm sure we'll find the car is much more sporty than it looks. It's a big car and it feels big on the road. And that's not surprising really when you consider this actually built on the F017 series platform, which is a very big car indeed. Now, unlike its predecessor, which was almost entirely aluminium, this chassis is now all steel. It's 55% stiffer than the E60, but a bit heavier, but cheaper to build though. So there's playoffs here. Now, the reason you're gonna buy a 520D rather than one of the bigger engine options is because you're gonna be driving a long way and you want the economy, which is understandable. And if driven carefully, you should be able to make 55.4 mpg. Most owners don't quite see that. They see maybe low 50s, maybe high 40s if they're particularly enthusiastic. But it's still better than, say, a 530 would be. And it's got a 70 litre fuel tank, so it will go a very, very long way. On an E60, I've actually seen a thousand mile projected range. I'm not sure it would actually have driven that far if we tried, but it was thinking it might. Now, transmission-wise, you have two choices. In this car, we've got the six-speed manual, which I would say is definitely the good thing to go for, but a lot of people, for some reason, seem to like automatics, in which case you could have the ZF2F8HP eight-speed automatic, which I guess some people might like. Now, moving into sport mode, as we turn into a country lane, this thing feels quite brisk. You can feel it pushing from the back in a really quite fun way. This, a car this big shouldn't be this much fun to play with, really. But it is, which has always been BMW's trick. That perfect 50-50 weight distribution, nimble steering, good brakes, just connectedness with the driver. And something they've, again, gone back past the E60 series with, which had a very flat dashboard. They've gone back to the previous generation's ideas and having the entire central console pointing more towards the driver, that kind of cockpit feel, which they used to go for and be famous for. Now, part of that kind of light, nimble feeling in this big car is due to its really quite advanced suspension. The front suspension is double wishbone with double lower pivot arms and uses lots of aluminium. And in the rear, it's a multi-link, five-link integral V suspension system, which probably means something. And to keep the weight down, they've used an aluminium bonnet and aluminium doors, which saves a fair few kilograms over the car's overall weight. Something I always really liked about BMWs of old was a little downward hanging needle which gave you your instant fuel MPG, which is always quite impressive to see if you can get it off the chart on the bottom by accelerating very hard indeed. They've, checked, they've still got it, it's a BMW stalwart after all, but these days it's now a digital dial instead of a mechanical dial. 
Now, while I thought at first the interior was quite well appointed with cubby holes, something I've noticed as I've gone along driving in the car is that actually it's a little bit irritating in terms of places to put stuff when you're actually driving. There's nowhere to put a phone. The owner here has put like a little magnetic sucker on the air vent. Uh, this little uh, cubby hole, which would have been the ashtray on the smoker's pack car, isn't big enough to put a phone into either when it's up or down. There's nowhere, the cup holder is just big enough for your keys because it's keyless. So it could be a little bit better in that respect. But getting past that, actually driving the thing is an absolute joy. It clings to the road incredibly well and it's just huge fun. It's like a massive MX-5. The overwhelming impression you get from driving this car is just the sheer solidity of the thing. It just feels so well made, so tough. And that translates into the driving experience because the chassis is beautifully stiff, the car is always well composed and just feels like it's, you just feel like you're in control. It doesn't feel like a car that's gonna let you down or leave you spinning off a roundabout unexpectedly. It feels predictable. But there is a useful off button here. So if you really want to go play sideways in the rain, you can turn the traction control off and go and have a bit of fun with it. The equipment level on this car is great. Auto lights, auto wipers, cruise control, front and rear parking sensors, a parking camera on the back is an option. DAB was made standard during the, the production run of the car. You're not really gonna want for anything. Now, unlike the E60, which as time moved on, proved it to be less and less reliable, the F10 and F11 have actually proved themselves to be actually rather good with virtually no problems whatsoever. The timing chain issue kind of went away with the T version of the N47, which by the way made 188 horsepower and 380 newton meters of torque, but after 2014, 192 horsepower and 400 newton meters of torque, which is quite respectable for a car of this size getting this kind of economy. So yeah, on the used market, there's really not much to look out for. Timing chains making a bit of rattling noise because the timing chain's at the back of the engine, so it's quite an expensive job if you do have to do it, but not the end of the world. And also the airbags on the air suspension do fail. They're 500 pounds each, but they can be DIY changed if you know what you're doing. And they don't go that often. The one other small problem these do suffer with occasionally is water ingress. There's a grommet in the bulkhead which kind of perishes over time and it needs to be changed. It's not a massive job, but it's worth checking that if you've got damp carpets, that that has been done or is going to be done before you buy the car. That's kind of it really. They really did sort out a lot of the niggles they had with the, the previous generation when they got this generation sorted out. Well, they had to really, didn't they? In terms of performance, it's again quite impressive for the size of the engine and the size of the car. 0 to 60 in 8.3 seconds and a top speed of 138 miles an hour is really good. And then there's the image. It used to be that every bad driver who was a bit of a uh, -uh on the road was driving a BMW. They've now tended to migrate to a different brand and BMW drivers have just gone back to people who just like driving cars and appreciate a car that's well engineered and is gonna be quite good fun. Rear wheel drive, don't forget. So now you can relax in the fact you are not like, uh, uh by having a five series, you're just someone who can indicate. Look, I'm indicating now. With, its, um, with the M Sport side skirts and body kit, this actually looks quite aggressive and really very smart indeed. You have the bonus, of course, as well. If you happen to have a white shirt and maybe a yellow jacket, you might look quite a lot like a traffic officer. Which <laughs> I'm not suggesting you go down the, hard, the outside lane of the M1 at 95 miles an hour with everyone clearing your path. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Owners of Rover P6s, Rover SD1s, uh, previous generation 5 series, Rover 800s, going back to, well, the last 30 years, have found this same phenomena. If you happen to be driving a dark coloured, unmarked car, which looks a bit like a police car, say a Skoda VRS in a dark colour in the last couple of years, you will find people let you out at junctions if you're wearing a white shirt and a black tie. Just saying. It's worth remembering a lot of these cars will have started life as company vehicles, so they will have excellent early service records, but cosmetically check for swirl marks and other damage because people may have been a bit too hasty to take them through an automated car wash rather than bothering to hand wash their company car at the weekend. In terms of safety, these are very good. The driving experience is really good. Everything is just weighted perfectly. They've spent hundreds or thousands of hours driving these things just to get 
the perfect driving experience. The steering is just weighted just so. It's not too heavy, it's not too light. The pedals have got just the right amount of resistance in them, so you're not working too hard or getting like a tired leg if you're stuck in traffic, but if you're going through a twisty lane and you want to change gear for fun, then you're getting the right amount of feedback as well. The gear change is beautifully snickety. You can just punch it from one gear to the next, and if you're enjoying a spirited drive somewhere, it's brilliant. It's got the right kind of response and feedback to make you want to change gear, to knock it down a gear into the next corner. But if you're just driving around town at the same time, it's not hard work, it's not an effort to do. It, everything is easy and enjoyable. This is fantastic. In terms of rivals, you'd be looking at an Audi A6, which is very well made, lovely interior, but not as much fun to drive. A Mercedes E-Class, which is, again, not quite as much fun to drive and a beautiful interior, but it may be made slightly better, but the image of an E-Class is a bit airport taxi. And then, of course, you've got the big Volvos, which are your slightly offbeat, curious choice, which is worth taking a look at. Again, beautiful interiors, maybe not as much fun to drive, but they do have four-wheel drive options. 95% adult and 83% child occupant protection, which is pretty good going. So this was a 2012 BMW F11 520D M Sport Touring. And I would say it's actually an excellent buy. It does everything you want from a car incredibly well. It's big, it's comfortable, the gear change is fantastic, the steering's nice, the brakes are good, it drives nicely and it looks nice. What more do you really want from a car? From a personal point of view, when I bought my W204, I was actually thinking about buying one of these. Hmm. And I'm kind of starting to regret not buying one now. <laughs> Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time in something completely different.